recording. Okay, so the review of the March 2021 meeting minutes. Does anybody have any comments on that? Criticisms or anything like that? Okay, make a motion to accept those meeting minutes. Do we have a second? A second. I second it. Okay. Seconded by, I don't know the name there, but seconded by somebody. Okay. Seconded by Debbie. Debbie, thank you, Debbie. Okay. Uh, street street co naming application for Conti pastry, pastry Shop. So we've had an application that they want to change, uh, co name it actually for the Conti Pastry Shop that has been in the neighborhood for a long, long time. I personally don't have any objection. I know it's been there for numerous years. Does anybody have an objection to that? Okay. We make a motion for the co-naming application for Conti Pastry Shop, the motion that it should be accepted. Do we have a second to that? I'll second. It's Lisa. Okay, Lisa, second. Thank you. We could do that co naming. Okay, we're privileged to have our DOT people here tonight, and we're going to have a DOT presentation on the e scooter pilot program. So I will now turn it over to DOT for their presentation about the e scooter pilot program, and we thank them for coming. Good evening. Excuse me. Good evening, everybody. My name is Keith Kalb. I'm the Deputy Borough Commissioner for the Bronx DOT. Hello, good evening. I have Matt Arencio, a Director of Community Affairs and, and um, Planning with us. I also have uh, Teresa Cruz and Holly Malone, our Borough Planners for the Bronx from the Borough Commissioner's Office. And we are joined by Lily Gordon Coven, who is going to be making the presentation tonight. Brian Lee and Arnold Cruz. Am I missing anybody on your team, Lily? No. no. Um, okay. We're also joined by representatives from each of the scooter companies. If they want to very briefly just introduce themselves, um, Sam, we can start with you. Hi, I'm Sam Cooper, uh, senior manager for government partnerships for bird scooters. Really excited to be here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Phil Jones. I am the Senior Government Relations Director for Lime. Very happy to be here this evening. And Alex? Uh, yes, hi, Alex Keating. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Partnerships with VO. <clears throat> started and share screen. Can everyone see that? Great. Sorry, Lily, so, Lily, Lily, just before you get going, um, you know, thank you everybody for joining. This is Matt again from Bronx DOT. We just ask that you hold all your questions to the end and then we'll be more than happy to address any questions, comments, concerns you might have. Uh, you know, if you have questions beyond the e-scooter pilot, uh, we can reserve those for after the e-scooter pilot uh, questioning period as well. So just uh, if you wouldn't mind just holding all questions till the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll get to everybody. Great, thanks hey. Matt. And um, thanks again for having us. As Keith said, my name is Lily Gordon Coven. I'm the director of Dockless Pilots in the Bike Share Group at DOT. And we are expanding our work beyond Bike Share into Scooter Share. So we're excited to talk about this pilot program tonight. Um, so we'll start with just a little bit of background. So we're all on the same page. When we talk about e scooters, we are talking about the kinds of vehicles you see in this photo. An e-scooter is defined by state law as a device with handlebars, a floorboard, or a seat, and an electric motor. So these are not um, the sort of mopeds or Vespa-type vehicles, and they're also not the kick scooters that we see kids using. These vehicles are not registered with the DMV, and state law limits the maximum speed at 15 miles an hour. 
and riders should operate e-scooters in the same manner as they operate a bicycle. So that means not riding on the sidewalk, following all traffic laws, using bike facilities when they're available, and yielding to pedestrians. So now that we've talked about what is an e-scooter, what is e-scooter share? So e-scooter share is very similar in many ways to bike share, which you may be more familiar with. It's essentially a network of shared e-scooters intended for point-to-point -point transportation. So um, less intended for recreation, although it can be used for recreation, more intended to get from point A to point B. It is a form of increased mobility for New Yorkers. It really adds to the transportation menu that we already have in New York City. It's particularly convenient for trips that are too far to walk, but maybe too short for the subway or a car. Um, and we think it can be a great option to help connect people to transit. So rather than maybe having a 15 or 20 minute walk from your house to the subway or your bus stop, now you could have a, a couple minute, four or five minute um, scooter ride to the same place. Uh, E-scooter share is very flexible. So unlike the city bike, which you may be familiar with, is our dock bike share program in New York City. The vehicles are dockless and free locking, which really limits the infrastructure needs so we can be a bit more agile and move quicker. And users find unlock and lock e-scooters through a smartphone app. So a bit about how we got here, uh, bringing e-scooters to the East Bronx. In 2020, e-scooters became legal under state and local law, and the New York City Council mandated that DOT conduct a shared e-scooter pilot. Last fall, the DOT released an RFEI, Request for Expressions of Interest, for a dockless e-scooter shared pilot, and we went about evaluating the responses we received through the fall and into the winter of this year. We were evaluating companies based on their experience in other cities. Safety is a really key component here. Um, their operational models, their ability to provide accessible vehicles for all New Yorkers, equity and outreach, and consumer and labor policies. In February of this year, we announced the East Bronx as our pilot zone. And then just last month, we announced the three selected companies who you've already met tonight, Bird, Lime, and Vio. So this is the East Bronx pilot zone. It's essentially everything east of the Bronx River, and it's about 18 square miles in total, home to almost 570,000 New Yorkers. We are gonna be conducting this pilot in two phases. Phase one, which is the northern half, which you can see on the map in orange, includes Community Board 11, as well as Community Board 12 and part of Community Board 10. And it includes some key trip generators like the Jacoby and Montefiore Medical Centers and um, key connections to transit like we talked about already. We expect to see 3,000 scooters in this area in 2021, 1,000 for each of the three companies. And we'll also be working with other folks at DOT to help expand the bike network with targeted projects this year to, uh, to really enhance the bike network and make sure that there are safe facilities, not only for e-scooter users, but also for cyclists. Then in 2022, we expect to expand the program south into the phase two area, which you can see um, in pink on the map here. We would add an additional 3,000 scooters bringing the total of scooters to 6,000, 2,000 for each of the companies. And we're also beginning to work on expanding the bike network in this area so that by the time we ex expand into phase two, there's more bike infrastructure for people to use. So now we'll talk about uh, the key program elements. There's a lot of components here, so I'll go through them, but um, as Matt said, afterwards, we are we can definitely come back and talk more about any of the specifics. So these are the core vehicles that we expect to see on the street once we launch the pilot later this year. Um, you can see them from left to right, the Bird 3, the Lime Gen 4, and then the Astro Standing and Cosmo Seated Scooters. So there's a lot of, um, there's some differences between these vehicles, but in large part, they are very similar. Um, one key distinction that you'll note is that there's two VO scooters, one which is a seated scooter, which almost is, feels a bit more like you're sitting on a bicycle with no pedals. Um, you can see that the wheels are a bit bigger, so we're going to be interested to test um, how people prefer the seated versus standing models, as well as how people um, choose between the different companies. 
quickly we'll talk about how to ride. So it's similar to other forms of shared vehicles. Um, you'll download the app to your smartphone, register with a photo ID and payment information, and then you'll take an in-app safety training and complete a safety quiz. We understand that this form of vehicle is new for um, New Yorkers. It's recently just become legal. And so many people, most people in fact, won't really have had experience riding these vehicles. We wanna make sure that people really understand how to use them and how to use them safely before taking to the streets. Um, so we'll talk more about safety, but one of the key components is this in-app safety training and quiz. Once you're ready to ride, you'll open the, the app and you'll see a map of all the available e-scooters for that particular company in your area. You'll unlock the e-scooter by scanning a QR code on the vehicle. And then as we talked about before, you'll ride the e-scooter the e as you would ride a bicycle. When you're ready to end your trip, you'll park the scooter in one of two ways, either in a designated parking corral or on the sidewalk out of the path of travel. You'll follow the in-app directions and to lock and the scooter and end your trip. And um, you can see in this photo, the companies require you to verify your parking. Um, so you can see, um, you take a photo showing, hey, I parked my vehicle in the right place. Um, I parked it out of the path of travel or in a parking corral. Um, so that that's recorded in case there's any concerns or questions later on. In addition to um, parking, there's also a couple of other operational restrictions that we may look to add throughout the pilot based on the trip data that we see, the safety records, and requests from, from community partners. So one of those is a slow zone. This would be a bounded area within the service area where e-scooter speeds are capped below the typical limit of 15 miles an hour. So last week, for instance, we met with folks from Jacoby Medical Center. They expressed a potential interest in having their campus be a, uh, a slow zone. So that's something that we could look to add. Um, we can also implement no ride zones. So again, a bounded area within the service area where scooters cannot be ridden and the motor will cut off when the vehicle crosses the boundary. This is also what will happen if you try to ride a vehicle um, outside of the service area. So if you tried to ride to the West Bronx, the motor will cut off um, but, and you won't be able to use it, but you'll still be being charged for your trip until you return it to the service area and park it. And then lastly, um, shorter, term, shorter term temporal restrictions like limiting overnight riding or restricting riding during inclement weather. So we have a lot of flexibility with this pilot program um, and we can add these things depending on what we see is happening in the field, um, but we can also change them once that we've implemented them, remove them if we need to. So this is just some of what we have um, on the menu. A bit about the pricing. So um, the companies all use similar pricing models with some slight differentiation. So the starting, uh, fee is $1 to unlock the scooter and then either 30 or 39 cents per minute. So the longer your trip, the more expensive your, your, your trip. Um, they all also have reduced fare programs for low income New Yorkers, particularly targeted at NYCHA residents and SNAP recipients. And these programs greatly reduce the cost um, of using the program. So a bit about more about safety. We already talked about the in-app safety training and quiz for new riders. We'll also have a beginner mode, which requires that a user's first 30 minutes of trips are limited to 10 miles an hour and can't occur in darkness or overnight. So you can't leave the bar or restaurant at 11 p.m. and decide this is when you wanna take your first trip. Again, going back to this idea of, of practice, we really wanna make sure that people know how to use these vehicles, that they're comfortable with them, um, so we're going to prohibit um, people from, from taking those trips, first trips overnight. Um, the companies will also be required to create helmet giveaway programs and or discounted purchase programs. Helmets are not required to, uh, for the, the program, but strongly, strongly encouraged. Companies will also be holding a minimum of four free voluntary in-person lessons each month. And you can see a photo of one of those here. Um, obviously this is pre-pandemic, but um, this again is a way for people to test out the scooters um, off street so that by the time you ride in the street, you're comfortable and understand how to use the vehicle. 
The companies will also be creating rider accountability and account sharing prevention policies. We want to make sure that people are using the program responsibly. And then lastly, a community reporting tool, which will enable members of the public to report improperly parked scooters or dangerous rider behavior without having to sign up uh, for the app and go through the training and all of that. Accessibility is another key part of this program. We want to make sure that uh, the program is accessible and available to all New Yorkers who want to ride a scooter. So the companies will be required to provide accessible vehicle options. You can see some of those here um, on, on this slide. Um, and at launch, most of these vehicles will be available for longer term rentals and delivered to a user's home or picked up at a partner organization site. Companies will also be required to meet regularly with uh, us at the DOT, as well as our colleagues at the mayor's office for people with disabilities on accessibility issues and concerns. And then another piece that we talked a little bit about is consumer and labor protection. So we've designed this contract with provisions that are designed to protect riders and workers and promote safe operational practices. So to that end, vendors are not permitted to include binding arbitration or, excuse me, or class action waivers in their provisions in their terms of service and companies must use W2 employees for operations. So no gig labor or franchise agreements will be permitted. So all the work that's done um, across the pilot program will be done by regular employees. Okay, so now we're gonna move into talking about the parking model. Um, this is something we really wanna highlight because we know it's a big part of how this program can be a success. So there's a couple of components here. The first is how the vehicles park um, individually. The vehicles will be free locking, which means that they are don't need to be affixed to um, a, a, an object like a bike rack or a sign or something like that. Um, they are locked using the smartphone and the onboard computer. So um, we chose to go with this option because we know that there is a, a current lack of bike parking in, across a lot of New York City, and we don't want to further add to the limits on bike parking um, or the, the lack of bike parking and, and make things harder for private cyclists. In terms of where in the right of way the vehicles will park, we're gonna start with a hybrid model where we have some mandatory e-scooter corrals on busy corridors and then free floating parking in other areas. So in free floating parking areas, e-scooters must be parked on the sidewalk in the furniture zone. And in mandatory corral zones, scooters must be parked in a corral if a rider wants to end their trip in these zones. So these are busy areas where we think there's gonna be a lot of demand as well as um, already a lot of existing activity with pedestrians, buses, other vehicles. So we really wanna make sure that the scooter program is well organized and not creating any sidewalk clutter. So you can see this is an image of um, White Plains Road in the center here. And essentially, if you wanna park your, your scooter um, in this area, you'll have to do it in a corral. You won't be able to end your trip within the no parking zone unless you parked it in a corral. So a bit more about the free floating parking. Um, free floating parking really maximizes the flexibility of this kind of program. So in most of the pilot area, users can park their e-scooter on the sidewalk in the furniture zone, which we've highlighted in this photo here. This is the area where you might find a tree pit, um, a bike rack, a newsstand, a sign pole, anything like that, the area against the, the curb. So you're not blocking the path of travel. So when parking in the free floating zone, users must not block the pedestrian path of travel, including pedestrian ramps at the corners, block driveways or curb cuts, or park in the roadbed or on private property. The operators will be required to respond quickly to improperly parked vehicles. And there's several ways that you as a community member can report this uh, any uh, form of improperly parked vehicles. You can call the customer service number that will be printed on all the vehicles on the pilot. That's gonna be the easiest thing probably for most people. You see the scooter, you walk up, you look at the number and you call it. You can also use the community reporting feature in the operator's smartphone app, or you can call 311. So in some areas, um, we'll have mandatory parking corrals. 
And these parking corrals will help us minimize sidewalk uh, sidewalk clutter on busy corridors. So if you want to end your trip in one of these areas, you must park in a corral. The corrals will be planned by DOT and installed, paid for, and maintained by the three companies. We plan to launch with approximately 90 corrals and expect to add as the pilot continues. So this map uh, shows some of the areas that we're looking to install parking corrals, particularly White Plains Road, Bronx Boulevard, Westchester Square, the Jacoby Medical Center campus, Co-op City, as well as Pelham Bay Park. We are going to be accepting input on corral locations on our DOT website throughout the pilot um, because we'll probably be looking to add additional, uh, additional corrals as we go through the program. This is showing a mock-up of what the corrals will look like. They will be fairly straightforward and simple. So. The, we'll have two versions, one that's for the sidewalk and one that's for the roadbed, but both are essentially a painted white box with a logo inside. And you can see the ones on the street will also have flexible posts to prevent vehicles from parking there. So this is where we're proposing to install corrals in CB11. Um, as you'll remember from the previous slide, we're looking mostly at White Plains Road here. So in this section, we propose to, or in Community Board 11, I should say, we propose to install 24 parking corrals at launch, 19 of which are on, this, on the sidewalk and five of which are on the roadbed. We're also working closely with Jacoby Medical Center on additional corral locations on their campus. So this means that if you wanna park anywhere within this orange area, you'll have to do so at one of these corral locations. And it's really important for us to have a high density of corrals in these areas so that we are providing enough space within the larger no parking zone for people to, to find a place to park. Um, so it's important for us to have that density and a high network and a uh, density and, and a really good network of corrals. So even though it looks like a lot of them, they're basically every block, we really want to make it easy for people to use these corrals um, and think that this is um, the best way to do that, particularly taking a lot of the lessons we've learned over the past several years with city bikes. So we've taken a lot of the planning um, principles that we use with city bike and applied them here. So this is just a closer look at the proposed locations. Um, you can see the sidewalk locations, which is everything on this slide, are uh, triangles, and then the letters within them um, are the cardinal direction of the street. And we'll be sending this around um, at, at later tonight or tomorrow, so you can have a closer look. But you can see we have one basically every block in this section, um, and they're all, as I said, on the sidewalk. And then this is the southern section of that same area um, and a bit more of a mix, but we have mostly still on the sidewalk and then a couple of locations on the roadbed um, along Pelham Parkway. So just to wrap up, we'll talk about the timeline to launch. So um, in April we started, or we had already started, but we were really working through the pilot planning and citing all of these corrals, going out into the field and looking for locations, where could we put them? Um, and working with the companies to set up their operations for the coming months. Um, in April and May, we've been doing outreach to stakeholders, including elected officials, community boards, bids, the Jacoby and Montefiore hospitals and advocacy groups. In May, starting today, we'll be sharing corral locations with stakeholders such as yourselves and preparing for the installations. We expect to begin installing corrals in early June and conduct pre-launch outreach where we'll have folks on the street um, helping people understand what the program is, how to use it, how to sign up, as well as distributing safety information and helmets. And then we expect to launch towards the end of June with 3,000 scooters. Um, and we'll be conducting a lot of additional outreach through the spring, or so, excuse me, through this, the rest of the summer and, and throughout the pilot. So that is the presentation. I'll stop there and um, open it up for questions. Okay, so my first question is, and I think you covered it a little bit, uh, is there an age bracket that's gonna be allowed to use these? And in terms of safety, 
what has been tested in terms of safety elements? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, to use any of these co uh, company scooters, you have to be 18 years old. So that will be the minimum requirement. Um, the state law says that you can ride a scooter if you're over 16. Um, but all the companies say that you have to be over 18. So 18 is the minimum for this pilot program, but you could ride a private scooter if you're 16 and older. Um, and then safety is, is really our biggest concern um, with everything we do at DOT, but especially with any new kinds of vehicles and infrastructure. So we've learned a lot from our other programs, um, including bike share, including um, e-moped share, um, as well as, of course, the vision zero efforts that have been um, the city has been working on for many, many years. So we've taken a lot of the lessons learned from from those programs and applied that here. Um, and you can see some of that in the requiring companies to hold in person lessons, reducing the speed for new users, um, as well as in some of the vehicle elements. So if you've been to another city in the past couple of years and seen these kinds of vehicles, there's been a lot of development. Um, and we think that these vehicles are a lot safer um, and more robust than some of the earlier iterations. So that's just some of what we're looking at. We're, of course, um, also partnering with others at DOT to improve the bike network so that there's robust, safe infrastructure for e-scooter users as well as other uh, users of, of scooters and bikes. Okay. And so in terms of safety, it's a byproduct question. Would a scooter like this go fly, go down a very steep hill? Is there anything stopping it? Or it could go long it's within the boundaries? And that's the second part of my question is, let's say we're in Pelham Parkway. If somebody decides to take a spin on the Bronx River Parkway, is there anything going to be to stop them to do that? So you uh, are, you know, you, you can ride these the same way that you ride a bicycle. So. Um, it would be prohibited to take one of these onto a highway um, or on a roadway where the speed limit is over the, um, the normal 25, 30 miles an hour. Um, so that's one part of your question. And then in terms of going down a hill, so the speed limit on all these vehicles is 15 miles an hour. And they all have two brakes um, as well as um, uh, some of them also have turning signals. So they have a number of safety features on the vehicle. Um, so that you don't, you know, go extra fast um, or, um, you know, uh, run into to trouble as you're using it. Okay, so my final before anybody else goes is what has been the reaction of the Uber, the taxi industry, the MTA in regard to this taking away possible revenue from them? That's a good question. I am. I don't think that we've really heard too much from. Um, the taxi or for hire vehicle industry or the MTA about this. I think our hope is that rather than taking people out of transit, out of, you know, rather than saying someone saying, I'm not going to ride um, the bus, that they may say, I'm not going to, um, to get into my car or to take a taxi. We want to encourage people to be using um, more sustainable and um, lower impact vehicles throughout the city. So we really haven't heard too much from them, um, but that's something we can look out for. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lily? Yes. Yeah, I got uh, a few things. Number one, is it possible, can you put your email in, your, in the chat box so that if I have any further questions to you, um, I could reach out to you? And number two, um, with Rabbi mentioning, like with the Bronx River Parkway, is there something that would govern uh, the scooter not to be able to go in there? Because, yes, I know you and I know it's not legal to put the scooter on the Bronx River, but somebody will try. Is there something that will cut it off and not allow it to go on there? Yeah. So we can look to add a, like a um, geographic restrictions like we talked about before, the no ride zone. So if there's particular concerns around an area where, um, you know, a scooter user should should know, as you're saying, like not to ride there, but we think there may be an issue, we can add in an extra layer of protection there by, by adding a no ride zone so that the, the motor will cut off if you try to get onto the parkway, let's say. 
Um, and then I'm going to say that let's um, Keith. Uh, the best way to get in touch with extra questions for me is just going to go be to go through Keith and um, Keith's team, um, and they'll they'll help with that coordination. Yeah, Debbie. We anything any follow up questions you have any on any of these issues, you come through our office and we'll get all the right answers for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it looks Matt like Matt just put. His, put yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Lily. Matt just put his email in the chat. Um, I have a question. Um, this is Lisa from the committee. Um, can you clarify a little bit the free? I forgot what you called it, but like the like free standing or floating parking. It. I just wasn't clear on like how do you know where those like are those going to be marked anywhere, or do you just have to know, um, or is it just assumed anywhere? Uh, anywhere that's not a no parking. Like how will people know where these free floating parking zones are. Sure. So most of the service area is going to be this free floating parking zone. We'll have a limited area uh, areas that have this mandatory corrals, right? But you can see that's just the red lines and the red red circles. So the rest of the area is going to fall into this free floating parking zone um, segment. So we won't have markings on the street. Um, this is just sort of to demonstrate the area we're talking about. Um, users will be informed of where and how to park when they're using the smartphone apps um, of each of the companies. We'll tell them um, where, where to park, where not to park. Um, and so essentially anywhere um, in the service area that's not one of these mandatory corrals, users will park um, be informed to park in this furniture zone on the sidewalk. Does that make, clarify anything? Yes, thank you. And then my second question is, how are these powered? Like, are they electric? I assume that they're electric and they need to be charged. So if that's the case, how long, because you don't ha actually have charging stations, right? So how long um, can people go on them until they need to be charged? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the um vehicles have um batteries in them they have let's see there's two different models so the bird vehicle has um an integrated battery so when it needs to be charged the whole vehicle comes off the street and goes to a warehouse and gets charged um the lime and vo vehicles use swappable batteries so um a when a battery needs to be changed one of their technicians will um, will come out to the field and swap the batteries. Um, and they have, um, and anyone, Sam or um, Alex or Phil jump in here, um, the battery ranges, I believe are somewhere between 20 and 40 miles, but please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. Oh, that's correct. It's, it pretty yeah. much ranges between that. Yeah, at least a uh, 30 mile range for birds battery. Okay, yeah, and then like the, the rider will know like how far they can go, like they won't get kind of like, you know, halfway to their destination with the battery running out if they're not being told how far they can go with it. Yes, there will yeah. be a percentage that shows up on on each of them on how much battery is left when they actually go up to open it. So they'll know, yeah, know. They understand it, how much it, it will it will also be in the app as well. Okay. And um, yeah. you know, once it gets to a certain percentage, you won't be able to start a ride uh, on bird scooters. So you know, you you can't. Start a low percentage ride and then you know get stranded as you suggest. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa. I I, Lisa, Lisa, I personally have an e-scooter myself. So yeah, there it on the app, it does say how much battery life you have. So even though mine's not any of these brands, it's kind of a uniform uh idea. Got it. Okay. I, thank I you. have a question. This is Wallace. I have a question. Um, the Bronx now, as far as safety back to safety is concerned, where are people primarily going to ride this? The Bronx is doesn't have as many bike lanes for these scooters to travel safely. And um, that's that's a safety concern for people. that want to ride these things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we, so you can use um, a bike lane where it's available, but you're not required to ride only in the bike lane. You can. Ride as you would ride a bicycle. So, 
Um, similarly, you know, you want to ride your bike on a street that doesn't have a bike lane, as long as it's not a highway or um, mm -hmm. another major street that, that where you're prevented from riding a bike, you can ride um, ride there. And, and we can share some resources from the DOT bike group on, on, um, on riding and how to ride when there isn't a bike lane. Um, that's also why we're looking to expand the bike network in this area, as well as in the, the southern part in the phase two area over the next couple of years so that we are adding more um, infrastructure for people to use. Oh, Matt, we can oh, provide sorry. A, sorry, this is Matt. We can provide a copy of that map too that shows the bike network expansion. Uh, that was something that came and that, the map was released as part of the original press release of this, but you know, it might have been lost or, you know, sometimes people just don't catch those media press releases. So you know, as a follow up to this meeting, I can certainly share with the board here a copy of that map. That way you'll be able to see what corridors are, have been identified for future safety improvement projects. Most notably, one of them is we're looking at right now is East Chester Road. Um, and so, you know, we'll come back and talk further about that at a later date. Um, you know, we've already spoken to the community board once about Bronxdale Avenue. Uh, so there are a few corridors that um, we are looking at in addition to others in the future. So I'll share that map as a follow up to this meeting. Oh, okay. I had a second question. Are these? Wait, I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Um, Rabbi, do you want to make sure that um the that there are members of the committee who don't have further questions before we go to the public? Uh, yeah, I would like that very much because I still have some more questions. So let me just ask two, and then we could go to the public. No problem whatsoever. I'm sorry, I can't see anybody. I have a few questions too. Okay, so my question is one. It's also a double. Why did you pick this area of the Bronx? And two, who is your targeted audience that you really want to get? Is it the student? Is it the shopper? Or is it the doctor from, uh, I think you said Montefiore Hospital or Jacoby? Who are you really thinking is going to be your target audience? Mm -hmm. Those are both very good questions. So the first one about how we chose this area, uh, we, we were looking at areas where there was both um, some transit access, but also um, um, some transit access, but also areas that maybe it's harder to get from a neighborhood to the subway. So, um, so we were looking at for an area that had a mix of that. We also wanted to make sure that we were not um, in the same area that City Bike operates, so that we were spreading the sort of the wealth of, of all these great new micro mobility options around. Um, and we were also looking at places where there was some bike infrastructure, but also opportunities to build more. Um, so it's a little bit about how we, how we got to this service area. Um, and in terms of the, the, the demographic targets, I think it's really a mix. It's, um, you know, we really want to target people who um, maybe have, are looking for alternative, easier ways to get from point A to point B, and especially people that are making those um, what we call first and last mile connections from transit uh, to their house or from transit to their job. Um, so it could be people that work in the hospitals. It could be people that live in co-op city and want to get to the subway faster. It could be people that are, um, you know, looking at for connections between um, some of the neighborhoods on the western side of this service area to Pelham Park. Um, so it's really is a wide uh, range of types of people that we're looking we're looking to engage here. One thing that I'll say is that other cities that have introduced these kinds of programs have seen pretty wide um, and, and diverse um, participation from both men and women, from people of different backgrounds, from people of different socioeconomic statuses, which is again why we're really um, trying to promote the low income um, discounts. Um, so it is really a wide um, array of people, but I think the the sort of overarching feature is is getting people to um, to move around in a more sustainable um, and low cost way. Thank you so much. Okay, turn it over to the other committee member. We had a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, like if you rent if you rent it over at um, say White Plains Road, are you able to ride the scooter? to say co-op city, or is that not allowed? Yeah, absolutely. You're able to basically anywhere within the service area, you'll be able to ride and, you know, start and end your trip. 
So you, you're saying any anywhere within that phase, where you're saying the phase one, anywhere within that uh, highlighted area, you can ride? Yes. Anywhere within here, of course, again, you know, without going on a parkway or something like that, right, um, right. you'll be able to ride. Um, so, and then once we expand to the phase two, it will be anywhere in either of these areas. So I see that you do, you do not have uh, City Island highlighted. So that would be like a, a, a no go zone. Yeah, so um, one thing we saw in from other cities. Yeah, I'm, I'm on a meeting. I'm on a work meeting right now. I'll come down in a little while and get it. Just leave it there. Thank you. Um, one thing that we saw from other cities was that the trips for e scooters and these kinds of programs were mostly um, under two miles. And so um, we, we wanted to make sure that you, you know, we're providing access um, in a way that makes sense. And there are some concerns around. Um, Making sure that you know that's an appropriate trip lane for people, um, so that's why City Island is not included at this time. I mean, because White Plains Road to say Co-op City, that's that's approximately four miles, but yet you can't go to Pelham Bay Park, can't go from Pelham Bay Park to City Island, which is like right there. That I don't know. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's certainly something that we can look at more. We also were wanting to make sure that we're coordinating really well with the parks department and understanding how they want their their property to be used. So that's also part of the coordination here is that um, they the the, um, department, the parks department may have considerations and concerns that would limit um, trips from starting inside the park at certain times. We want to make sure that the program is accessible twenty four seven. But again, something that we can look into more. And just just to add on to that is, or I can't tell from this map, but is Orchard Beach also whited out? No, it's just um, it's just the map um, that you would be able to ride to Orchard Beach. And we were working with the Parks Department on identifying corral locations within the park. Okay, okay, but yeah, I I, kind of, I agree with Debbie on the City Island piece, especially because. There's so much traffic in and out of City Island on weekends during the summer that this could could potentially help alleviate that if that is one of your goals. Sorry, Debbie, didn't mean to jump in on your question. No, that's basically kind of what I'm getting to is that you're able to go to Orchard Beach and Orchard Beach to City Island is right there, but yet, you know, it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we can look into that more. This is certainly a conversation we can have with community board 10 because it would no, it would impact them ultimately. So, you know, we can definitely take your concerns, share them with community board 10 and see what community board 10 has to say about, you know, expanding the service area to city island. So definitely noted. Yeah, because uh, co-op city and a whole bunch of this in phase one is already in CB10. So I figured you already had that discussion with CB10. We are meeting with CB10 next week. Okay, so we officially have eight more minutes to go. Uh, everybody, I have another. I have, I'm yeah, sorry, I have an, I have another question. Um, this is Wallace again. My question is concerning um, theft. Now, if this is the Bronx and things do happen, so how would one go about a uh, user go about? Um, Filing a police report, or what happens if the if the vehicle is stolen while under their um, uh, possession? Sure. Um, maybe someone from one of the companies wants to answer that. I, I can jump in. Uh, it's Alex Keating with uh, Vio. So yeah, that's usually not going to be since the the I guess the good news in that case is that the individual who's riding it is not the owner. Uh, we, the company, or the owner of that vehicle, and. Whenever anything unusual happens uh, during a trip, the user can just call, use the app, or just call from any phone the customer service line directly to, uh, to you know, to our company, to our customers, customer service department, and they'll help them figure out what they need to do just to end their engagement with it, and then we would be handling a police report on our stolen uh, property, essentially. So we would take over immediately on behalf of that rider. And, and of course, help them troubleshoot whatever they need to do to find another vehicle or 
whatever it is they need to do along their way, but primarily we would just be taking over there. Okay, thank you for the thank you for the response. Hi, I have a question. Can I ask a question? Yes, you could ask a question now. Um, if um, is there any way that people without a smartphone will be able to access uh, this program? Yeah, again, I'll, I'll um, hand it over to someone from one of the companies to talk about um, ways that people can use the program without a smartphone or without a credit card, if that's. Yeah, I, I think again, I think it's fairly uniform, but of course, the other companies can jump in. Um, we'll always be allowing folks who either don't have a smartphone or are frankly unbanked um, and maybe don't have a credit card. So if you don't have a, a smartphone, what you would do is. Uh, set up an account either online from a, a home or library computer or by calling customer service. And you can do the same thing in terms of starting a trip or ending a trip by calling customer service. So if you have any access to a phone, you can start and end a trip as long as you're near the vehicle. Um, and then in terms of being uh, unbanked, if you, you can utilize, uh, again, I can't speak for all the companies. In our case, we, we tend to have folks utilize prepaid debit cards, which they can register with us. Uh, and then utilize the service without needing to link to a, a credit card. Is there any awesome. thought a discount at the beginning? Yeah, Did I get one okay. free? Well, I, I'd imagine all the uh, all the companies handle promotions and discounts differently. It's certainly something that you know we always look at. How can we Hello? grow our use in a market as quickly as you know as quickly as possible? Be useful to to the folks uh, that in, in the communities. So we, we always look at that, but that's going to be handled on a, on a very case by case basis in terms of specific promotions that, that you might see. Thank you. Hi, this is Diana Finch from BPECA. I don't understand the charging. What if you live in a remote area, you pick up a scooter from a central subway stop, you ride it home, you park it outside your apartment, and then it stays there all night. And then in the morning, you get out and get on and go back to the subway. You get charged yeah. for the overnight time when the scooter is parked, or how does that work? So, no, you so don't. if you were to, if if you were to to ride your the scooter from the subway to your apartment, um, you would end your trip, and so you would stop being charged, and you would leave it out. You could leave it outside your your apartment, and then the next morning, if it is still there, um, you could start a new trip. But of course, there's no necess necessarily not a guarantee that the scooter will still be there and that somebody else won't come along and take it. So that's why um, we are um, going to be encouraging and requiring the companies to have distribute to distribute the, the vehicles across the service area. Um, and you'll also be able to look in your in your smartphone when you wake up and see where the nearest scooter is to you, how charged it is, that kind of thing. And what's to prevent someone from taking the scooter like into their yard and locking it up behind a gate? In inside their yard or, or something like that. Yeah, so the the scooters don't um, they're self locking. So there's, you know, you, I mean, I guess you could. You could. Right. Sorry. I mean, bringing it inside to a garage or. Around the back in their yard and locking the gate to the yard, not locking the scooter, locking the gate to the yard, you know, hiding it on their property. So it stays there. <laughs> For sure. the night. Yeah, so the companies all have um, GPS in these in their vehicles, and so they'll be able to first tell um, how long a vehicle has been idle. And we're requiring that the vehicles be if the vehicle, let's say you put it in your um, in your backyard overnight and then and it stays there for over a day or so that the company would be would know that it's been there. Um, they'll also know that it's not on the street. So have the ability to see where it is, if it's on the street, if it's in use, um, or if it is, you know, in, in, in private ends up in private property, um, they'll also know who was the last person to use the scooter, which uh, in this case would likely probably be the person who had put it there. Any and and uh, folks, anyone have anything to, to add to that? Hi, am I able to ask a question? What, uh, you're picking White Plains Road for this project, correct? So there will be uh, corrals no. on White Plains Road, yes. What about the vendors? Bob, 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 the entire area of phase one that they're showing on the map right now 
is included in this year's program, this year's pilot e-scooter zone. This is the first that the, the community hears of this. You have White Plains Road, which you can't put a bike lane because it's too dangerous. You don't want these e-scooters to be riding on the side of the road. So where are they going to run? I'm, I'm sorry, sorry Bob. Repeat the question. You have White Plains Road. Right, I'm sorry. If everybody, if you're not speaking, if you're not the one that's speaking, if everybody can just mute. White Plains Road is too dangerous for a bike lane. You don't want these bikes to be ridden on the sidewalk. They will have to be ridden on the street. All right. Uh, what is like someone said before, you are looking for accidents and then you have vendors on the street and also you have restaurants, which you're going to be taking away spaces for outside dining because they need eight feet to have outside dining an eight foot walkway. All right, I don't see, and this seems to be the first time this is coming to the community board. Because it uh, is the first time it's coming to the community board because the project hasn't started yet. The 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 winners of the of the pilot the program the zones here were just announced. So this okay. is the first okay. touch with the community board, Bob. You're correct. Don't you think that you should have come to the community board to ask them where they would like these bike corrals and bike lanes or whatever you know with these stocking stations or whatever? That's in part the purpose of this meeting where during the presentation, Lily shared locations of corrals, most of which are on the sidewalk and most of which are wide enough sidewalks that don't impact are not in front of restaurants or other businesses. So during the selection process, we were very, let, let me finish. We were very concerned about not conflicting with issues such as small businesses or restaurants. And so lots of the locations selected, a majority of the locations selected are very wide sidewalks. Well, now the roadbed, the roadbed location. I'm still not finished. Um, so the roadbed locations, most of them are actually in no standing areas too. So we really tried to minimize the impact of the community from a parking standpoint and from a business operations standpoint. And you're welcome to consult the map in the presentation that we hey, previously you also shared. Have a project on Pelham Parkway and White Plains Road Bob, that's going to be there for another year. But yes, we're, we're we're coordinating with all the capital projects that will be affected in the zones, and we're working with all the stakeholders. Yes, so we've already reached out to the bid, the White Plains Road bid. We've already reached out to them. We're coordinating with them. We're working with them. We've already touched base with the Department of Design and Construction to discuss the Pelham Parkway stretch. We've already done all those things. We've reached out to Camellia from the, from the Morris Park uh, Business Improvement District. We are working with all the bids. We are going to put corrals where they have the least amount of community impact. That is what Lily said earlier. We've, we've, we've already posted the, the map online so that people can give us their feedback. The portal's active and, and you can supply as many comments as you want on the locations. Thank you. I think that's great. Okay. I'm sorry, can I ask a question please? I haven't had my turn. One small question. Is that okay? It has to be a small because we had an hour. <laughs> I know, but I waited and I if I don't jump in, I'll never get my turn. Well, I have several questions. I somebody. My only question to not to waste time. Why is not Morris Park considered in this uh, corridor options since they just had recently a road diet and then I listed as a possible. Um, Corridor for this pilot program. Morris Park is included in the entire zone. And yeah, so you'll be able to. So we're just not putting corrals on Morris Park Avenue. That was my question. Why not? So we're not. We are starting with a smaller number of corrals. We want to really understand both how how the corrals work, um, how well they work, um, what the design, how people feel about the design, how informative they are. Um, as well as really understand where people are riding. So we want to see what trip patterns emerge before we add um, additional corral. So certainly in the future, we would, we would look to potentially add corrals to Morris Park Ave um, and other areas as well. But this, this is what we're starting with. I only asked it because Pound Parkway does not have a bike lane, but Morris Park, uh, Morris Park Road Diet does. So, and, uh, right, right. and uh, wait, wait, 
And I'm sorry, and I, I'm not gonna take much time, but you know, Friends of Palm Parkway, we have over um, 25 core members and over 70, 65 volunteers. So hopefully we're part of, that, of this discussion. So thank you. Yeah, Ro yeah. Ro Roxanne, there is a greenway on the Palm Parkway. Yes, but it's not a bike lane, pedestrian pathway. That's the it's issue a, we've been having. It's a greenway, which allows for bicyclists. That yeah, have you seen the pathway? It's basically strollers and people on um foot. There's no room. We have been having issue with we have illegal motorcycles and delivery. And I, if I but if I, were you, I, would, I would I would I would talk to the communion board and ask them to re request us to look at perhaps putting bike lanes on street. But you're going to have to consult with the communion board. No, I already spoken to the commissioner, but there's a construction underway that's not possible right now. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for your your comment, Representative. Could you give us the address um, for where the map online is? Yes. So we'll be posting the map. Um, we'll be posting this presentation. Um, tomorrow, and um, we'll be sharing the link with you through um, Keith and Matt's office. Um, and um, there's a link. We'll send this link as well, but there is a link in the presentation to the feedback portal. And if you go there, you can tell us where you think it would be a good idea to put a corral or to not put a corral. Uh -huh. Uh, just a reminder to anybody, just a reminder to anybody, I see a lot of questions, a lot of commentary in the chat. Uh, just, you know, please feel I've left my email there twice. I'll leave my email there one more time. You're welcome there to, you're welcome to email me any addition, additional questions that we don't get to during the meeting today. So I'm going to leave my email there again, but just feel free to reach out to me. Uh, hi, this is Greg Kislov. Um, I haven't seen the plan. So I'm a, a late comer to this process, but if you're suggesting corrals on White Plains Road between the Pelham Parkway South Service Road and Leidig Avenue, I don't think that would be particularly practical. The corrals, uh, we are proposing corrals, the green triangles and squares that you can see within this orange area, that's where we're proposing corrals for community board 11 and um, all of the triangle locations are on the sidewalk and the roadbed locations are on the are in the the squares are roadbed locations so all of the roadbed locations are um, on or adjacent to Palm Parkway everything else is on the sidewalk and again we want really want to make sure that we have a dense network of available corrals so that we're providing enough space for people to park um, and we know that this is going to be an area that people want to ride to because of the connections to transit, because of the commercial activity, you know, for all the same reasons that people on foot, on bike, um, in a car, on transit, want to get to this kind of area. Any more questions from the public? Roxanne, you're okay. Greg, you're okay. I have just one more oh, question. Thank you. Make, if oh. I could, real quick. Oh, thank you for asking, but I, I just would feel to regard to key. I think that he should um, consider engaging with the community that actually lives and is involved instead of um, the pushing it to community boards because we are a stakeholder and I don't think it's fair to say that anything we have to do has to go to community boards. You could also work directly with the public because we are the ones that get impacted by these, these decisions. Anyhow, thank you. Okay, duly noted. Thank you. Was there one Hi. final? Before I let them go, can you read any of the real quick that point? Matt, Matt, are you the same Matthew that I was emailing about certain other DOT issues, or is that the other Matt? No, that's me, Debbie. I, I owe you a response. I, I will have responses for you shortly, but it's the same Matt. Are you going to stay on the line after this presentation? Because on some old stuff, I needed to bring up some things to you. Uh, I can stay on the line, or you can just give me a call tomorrow too, Debbie. Which, whichever works best for you. All right, cool. Okay. 
Do you have the time to read a few questions in the chat? Um, that's up to the, the, the rabbi. You know, I, I was keeping an eye on the chat. It seems like it's evolved between conversations and then also questions. So I don't really know how to prioritize one question over another. So I really think, you know, just feel free, if, if anybody who comments in the chat, feel free to email me and we'll give you a response. And I'll just, I'll What's just reiterate that the, the email is in the chat. Um, it's, it's, um, M A R A N I A N C I O at dot.nyc.gov. I'll just also reiterate that this presentation will be online tomorrow as well as um, separate larger versions of these maps. Um, and um, you can also just Google NYC DOT um, scooters and a link to our website will, will come up. Okay. So, would you mind if I just ask one of the questions I had in chat? Is that okay? I think the best course of action would be to email Matt any additional questions. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm no longer at it. Please see. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you for all the representatives from DOT and all the companies. We appreciate your time. Well, over time, the committee and the public, okay, you have all the emails. Any questions you want, I'm sure you'll get them answered. Okay, everybody's good? Unanimous good. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Oh, Charlene. Yes, I'm. I don't know what your process is. If I cannot ask the question now, then you let me know how to do it. But I had a, a concern about the street co-naming process, and it wasn't related to Conti's in particular. And I was told to be present at this committee. I haven't had a chance to ask my question. Okay, sure. You can ask your question. No problem. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll be very quick. Um, I just think that the the regulations regarding the street co-naming are not clear. Um, we had some miscommunication regarding the street co-naming um, that's going on at White Plains Road and Kruger Avenue. It was said that um, the Vaness Neighborhood Alliance um, endorsed that, and that actually was not true. And then when we met, um, with uh, Yahe, he said that the regulations state that there should be, like the individual should have worked in the community for more uh, than 10 years. But he said, because the wording was not must, that's why um, he was allowed to put forth someone that really does not meet the stated criteria. So I just want to let you all know that that doesn't seem quite fair. This is the community board. And when people read the criteria and it says should, most people read that as these are the requirements. So I wanted to put that on record and I want you guys to really correct that because if you look at who has been honored before, it's always really about local people. And I think that that is very important because the community board is closest to people that actually live and work in the neighborhood. And it's the way we can participate in our political process. And I think the way this whole thing happened really undermined, you know, my confidence in the community board and what is going on. Okay. Charlene, whereas I somewhat agree with you on that, it was also brought to our attention and there is precedent in our uh, community board uh, with Mother Teresa uh, having a street naming and she never lived in the Bronx. Yes, I understand that. But really, even I, for me, that when you read the regulations and you look at the history of the street co-naming, it really is about honoring local people, like the woman that started Rain, like Conti, like um, Roscoe Brown, who was a Tuskegee Airman. And I think that that tradition is important so that when people look up at the street sign, they can relate to that person that's named or if it's somebody that does not know of that person, you can tell the story about how they have contributed to the community. So if that's not what be, then actually change it and state it explicitly. But I think the matter is important and that if you're going to change what it has tra traditionally been, that needs to be clear. 
because I know that it did correct the record regarding the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance, but it really, for me, what happened circumvents the whole purpose of that. And you can talk about the Mother Teresa and all that, and I get that. Mother Teresa, at least many people are familiar with her and she has affected the lives of many people within Community Board 11. But what happened was just irregular. And I don't like that I was that I was told that, well, it was the wording. It doesn't say must, so it, it's okay because it says should. And to me, that's that's kind of, you know, it may be correct literally, but it really circumvents circumvents the spirit of that uh, regulation. So it just needs to be right. Like yeah, like I said, I, I I do agree with you, and that's why I'm saying it was only brought, you know it was brought to my attention on how it got done because of like Mother Teresa and yeah. such like that. Okay, but I'm just saying that. I know that I want to participate in, and in every board meeting, I want to be present because I, uh, the way that this happened was really surprising to me. We do have representation and it, it, it's just irregular. And in order for a diverse community to stay strong and for everyone to feel good about where they live, things have to be done according to what is written. You cannot have, you know, like things changed when it suits particular individuals. That's how conflict is, gets started. And I don't want that in our community. Okay. I just want to say, just for Conti, there was letter, there is definitely a letter from the Morris Park uh, Association supporting that. Yes, and, the, and that was presented to the executive board at the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance, and the executive board is fully on board. We have our next meeting. We will present it to our community. And I have every confidence that because Conti's has been in the community for 90 years and has contributed, you know, throughout those decades, I don't, I don't think there's going to be any issue. I think that a place like Conti's is why we have the street co-naming. It really reflects the purpose of that regulation. Correct. Okay, well taken. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, we want to just continue our meeting. And I was in a rush to get the DOT, mm -hmm. so I think on number one and I just got to make sure from the committee members, is everybody unanimous on the meeting minutes and the uh, Conti Pastry Shop? Any objections? Any abstentions? Okay, good. Let's go to number four. Street activity permit. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Rabbi. I actually, I'm um, just going back to the Conti thing. I never, I don't know about the rest of the board, uh, mess, rest of the committee members, but I don't have an email on that. I, I, I didn't see it come in. So yeah. I actually neither did I. Yeah. That came from Jeremy, from Richard Bertacco, and I could forward it to people on the committee. I had a cup of tea and post this email morning. Well, six hours ago. So, if everybody who's not drinking can mute their phones, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did not get the email, so I cannot vote on something. So he's not going rushing through a vote because I did not get any, I did not get a contact email. So if you want to, we could table it for the next meeting and we'll forward everything on Conti to the next meeting. Um, that's, that's what the committee wants can to I, do. Can I chime in? Can chime I chime in? in? Can I chime in? What, one you thing, the the Orange uh, Taco, the, the sponsorship for the um, uh, with Conti, the um, the anniversary is October first, twenty twenty one for a hundred years. So um, I can email it to you uh, right now if you like, um, because it, it would have to go through in order to be for the city council for it to get approved by June, twenty twenty one, in order for it to be um, you know unveiled on October 1st on its 100th anniversary. So if you'd like, I have all the signatures we have. There was um, approximately um, three businesses on one side of the street, um, three buildings, seven buildings on the other side of the street, 18 residents or businesses, 
and it was definitely more than 40%. Myself and Sal Paljevic uh, worked diligently to get those, or Sal did both of the senior street naming issue. I wrote up the narrative. There's about 14 pages of photos, photographic evidence. Uh, we have the two letters of support from the uh, Mars Park bid and the Venice Neighborhood Alliance. If you'd like, I could, um, like I said, forward you the email, um, if anything. So, but like I said, it, 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 we're looking for, hopefully, uh, for to have it passed by the, the full board at the end of May and uh, to have it uh, in the hands of the city council by June when they pass their, their final um, you know, budget and everything like that, to have it done for October 1st, 2021 for their 100th anniversary. So that's the objective. If, um, so. Okay, well, would that, would be up to the, uh, that would be up to the other board members if they want to even remotely try to rush that, but I, I'm not home, so I'm not able to look at it on a computer, so I would not be able to even vote on that now, so. And we still have, a, we still have other items on the agenda, and um, so, I mean, I say we keep going with the rest of our items on the agenda, and. Rabbi, if you want, you can do uh, similar to what I did at leadership um, when there was a when there was a motion that I needed to get passed at the board meeting, and I just had I voted in leader I brought it up in leadership and I had leadership vote on it and then brought it to the board in the essence of time, but I think at this time we're already over our meeting time by 23 minutes. We still have other stuff to go. Like I know I'm not going to be able to read through all these documents and vote. Um, at this time, I also was not aware that there's only a set time limit of one hour for anything because there's a whole bunch of things I needed to bring up, but whatever. Okay. I mean, I don't think there's a, a it's not set in stone, but like Debbie, you know, our meetings are typically no more than an hour. Sometimes we go over a little bit, but it's already right. almost 830. Yeah, but this was special circumstances of a presentation. Okay, yes, I get that. But again, <laughs> we're we're talking and we're not moving on with our agenda. So let's keep going. Okay, and then we'll determine by the end of the meeting what we're doing with that Conti pastry shop one. Okay, street activity permit applications. We got two of them. We got from EID prayer, it's a religious event, which will take place on May 14th, and that is from 7 to 8 a.m. It's only an hour, and that's Rhinelander Avenue between White Plains Road and Hunt Avenue. Uh, there's been no complaints about that. It's only one hour. I do not see any reason. Does anybody see a reason? Any questions on this? Do we see any reason to object to this? No objection if there's never been an issue. Okay, so I make a motion to accept. Would somebody like to second it, please? Second it. Okay, are we all in favor? I believe yes. Any objections? And any, any other questions? Okay, we're good. Okay, next, Kingsland Avenue. And that's uh, looks like a block party, and that's taking place in June, June 12, 2021. They are within the guidelines of 12 p.m. to 9 p.m., although I think I have to ask Jeremy or somebody, Chris, I thought it's only eight hours. Maybe they added another hour. I thought it was only eight hours. Whatever, it's 12 to 9 it's Kingsland between Waring and Mace. I've not heard of any sort of rumblings of any problems with uh, accepting this. Does anybody have any questions? They, they, usually, they usually have to start breaking down at 8. And yeah. they have between 8 and 9 to, the, to do their breakdown. I was right. It was 8 hours and you got the hour. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, I make a motion to accept. This is never, we've not really had any problems over the years. I've been around with these type of block parties that stay within their limit. Um, 
<laughs> Motion to accept. Do we have a second on that one? Well, they they also got to make sure because I've seen in a few years past, if I'm not mistaken, for this. Which one is this? Uh, Kingsland between which and which? Between Waring and Mays. Okay, cause, all right, so then it was a, it's a different one because they got to make sure they do not block the street with vehicles. Correct. Are, are, are block parties being allowed right now with COVID regulations? Like, do we even know that? Yeah. I know CB10 had passed a bunch already, so it's, it's just like when they did Open Street on Rylander Avenue. Yeah, but no, open street is not a gathering. That was just like people can ride their bikes. This is literally a block party. It's an outdoor gathering. So I would just say like our vote should be, our vote can be contingent on whether or not it complies with city uh, and state outdoor gathering guidance, which I think just changed today, but I don't have it in front of me. It's kind of changing every day. And I guess to that we should really find out if indeed, I, might feel, if I, 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 I guess I guess you could put that asterisk to it, um, but yeah, by by That's May seventeenth, because it's coming up, so I don't want to hold it for there because of the date of what they're proposing when they're proposing to have it. But we should just say our vote is contingent on it being allowed, um, it being in accordance with the COVID safety guidelines, the outdoor gathering guidelines. Right. Right. If the, if the guidelines is X amount of people, we must probably should get a letter from whoever the head of this is that it will not exceed that amount of people. Now, that's a tough one because people float in and out. But I guess we'll go with we approve it contingent on, and again, the guidelines, who knows? By June, it's only a month away, but it could go up, it could go down. You never could tell. Contingent on following New York City guidelines for block parties. I say that the right way. Hello? Yep, that sounds about right. Okay. Do I have a second for that? I'll second it, it's Lisa. Everybody approve? Aye. Okay. Approved. Any objections and any abstentions? Okay, approved unanimous, approved unanimously contingent on regulations of New York City for block parties. Okay, now we go back to, should we go back? Let's go ahead and then maybe we'll go back. Let's go ahead to old business. Anything out there that's old? Okay. I, I got a laundry list of stuff that's old. Okay, so. Shall, shall I just bring this up? Shall I just email this straight to Matthew? Or do you want me to bring up the stuff here? How many, how much is this? Uh, no, I, you know, yeah, I'll just, I'll just bring it up. I'll just bring it up to Matthew. Uh, I'm going to save time. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else with old business? Okay, we're moving on to new business. If I have anything that's new. Hi, this is Diana Finch from uh, the Bronx Park East Community Association. I wanted Hi, to follow up on the traffic problem that we're having at the intersection of Thwaites and Boston Road which is caused by the construction down at Pelham Parkway in Boston Road. Um, okay. We really badly need a traffic agent so that the intersection doesn't get blocked every time the light changes. And it's only on certain days at certain times of day, but it's really bad when it happens. Um, the light changes two or three times and cars don't move uh, because okay, people have they have to the intersection. Back up. I should notice with being up on Parkway or on Thwaites or on both. Both, both. But the problem for Thwaites is that Thwaites is the exit. If you're heading south for that whole area, 
between Bronx Park East and um, Boston Road. Diana, that's, an, that that's a police enforcement issue, not a, not this. I thought, I, issue. sorry, I thought you're the transportation committee and you have to do yeah. with roads and traffic. I mean, yeah, but, but we need I all understand, the I understand that. what you're thinking, so but it's I'm not like anything you. we can do. What I'm saying is there's not anything we can do about moving the traffic that falls no, under what we're, what, we're requesting, what we're requesting is that we get a traffic agent at the times that the traffic's really heavy so that we don't have these traffic jams. Right, right. And traffic agents fall under. You're the transportation committee. Forgive me if I came to you in error. We need all the help we can get. So I'm reaching out to everyone I can think of. And I think the this traffic issue, agent has to be the, supplied by the, the, the. I think the traffic agent has to be supplied by the construction company or the construction project, and they discontinued the monthly meetings of the Pelham Parkway Task Force. So I don't really know where to go with this request. So I'm just reaching out to everyone I can think of. Say it loud and clear, Diana. And the truth of the matter is. I think it's very important to note that because as people are going to go back to work, that is only worse and worse, probably. And I understand that this intersection is not right in the middle of the construction zone, but it is so greatly affected by the construction. And I don't know if you remember, they put traffic agents there. Wow, must be four or five years ago. And then they were giving tickets for people stuck in the intersection. And that lasted for maybe a month and they stopped. Rabbi, excuse me. Are we still in public session? We are in new business now. We're in new business. Okay. Well, I'm not a member of the committee. So I can't comment. You could comment. Because Diana, Diana's not on um, committee either. She's speaking. Okay. Um, so right, so we, I'm, I'm sorry. Comments. Should we finish Diana's issue first before we move on to another topic? Unless that's what you're opining, can I, on, Greg. Can I address, uh, or, or at least make a suggestion to Ms. Finch? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, because I think that there's an overall problem uh, between. Uh, Thwaites, Boston Road, and White Plains Road in the context of movement of traffic across Pelham Parkway. It's a, it's a complete, uh, essentially, mess in just about every direction. There are traffic guards that are deployed on White Plains and Pelham Parkway, and also Boston Road and Pelham Parkway. But you also have an issue with the problem of the lights not being uh, coordinated so that you have some flows of traffic that are that are dead stop and others that are waiting for traffic that's partway moved into the several intersections. So the whole area is simply not working. Well, there's also part two of that. If you drive by every once in a while, you might see two of them working and two sitting in a car. And I've noted that yep. board meetings, but in regard to what you said and Diana, I will take that on my plate tomorrow and I am going to speak to Jeremy a bit. Because if weight gets worse and worse and worse, it's really gonna be, and besides that, you are right, Greg, Pelham Parkway is a problem there. That's been a problem still. It's been a problem for almost probably 10 years already. And as the cars come to get back, it is going to get worse and worse. So I will definitely. Another part, part of the problem making it even worse is that there's construction happening on Thwaites. So that that they've blocked off one of lane of traffic. So that instead is... of having two lanes where you could have the cars that are going straight and the cars that are turning right in separate lanes, you only have one lane 
That is so correct. If a car wants to turn right, but is blocked from turning right, then it blocks everyone, including the people who just want to go straight across. Right, and unfortunately, Diana, everybody knows that shortcut. They turn down Waring, and they come down whatever, Olinville, the other block, and then they go up Thwaites because they actually they save time. I don't know if they're saving time anymore. I really don't, but everybody has learned that shortcut already. Okay, okay we'll do that. Okay, and if you want, uh, I'm sure Mr. Jeremy has your email. I'll email back to you what I find out and what he recommends. Greg, if you have your email. Yep, I appreciate that. We'll send it back to both by on the committee. Once to find out what I find out, I'll be happy to send it back to everybody. Can I also just make a real quick comment? Yeah, quickie. Uh, very quickie. People are the getting... westbound roadway between White Plains Road and Boston Road, which is immediately below the section that's been uh, separated for construction, that yeah. roadway is almost undrivable. Yeah, you know what? I, I was thinking the same thing about their little uh, motorcycles, whatever they're calling those things. How are those things going to get through those roads? I have no well, idea. I think it's insane. Yeah, yep. yeah, I'm going to bring that up, but I guess they're going to be very strong motorcycles. What can I tell you? Yeah, well, duly noted. Okay, so let's go back within 60 seconds, and I don't know if I'm allowed to go do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. What do we want to do with the street co-naming application for Conti? What do we want to do? Obviously, you've heard there is a time deadline here. Our options are to table it. Our options are to send it to leadership, who will get it to the full board. I'll take anybody's comment, what they, they want to do. I mean, we have documentation. I've read the documentation. You have two of the organizations in the neighborhood that have fully supported it. We don't have the document, so we can't vote on it. The, the the members, you have it, Rabbi, but the members don't have it, nor is there really time to sufficiently review it. So okay. I understand that they have a deadline. So I I suggest <laughs> that we vote to push it to leadership so that it can be brought to the board in time to meet their deadline. Okay, I'll second that. That's fine with me. Everybody agree? Just one question, can you explain? I'm not, I'm not too familiar with the idea of leadership because can you explain the process for in terms of how it works in terms of bringing it to leadership? Just curious. What it is, is just we can't vote on it to bring it because right. even if we vote on it, if even if our committee was to vote on it tonight, it still has right. to go to the full board for me for our vote. So since Correct. we yeah. can't since we can't do that tonight, the next possible vote that can happen before the meeting is the leadership committee um, yeah, and, and, and the leadership, the leadership consists of the chairs of all the committees. So the Correct. chair of this committee can bring this to leadership, have leadership vote on it, and then leadership can bring it to the board for a full vote. Correct. Okay. If, if you'd like, I can present the information I do have if, if you'd like. Um, so if you're open to that, that's a possibility, but that's up to you. I mean, we have to see, we have to see the, 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 the documents. I appreciate that, but we as board members have to see the actual documents. We have to see the signature list and everything. I have all that here. And we already have one member who said she, she's on her phone and she's not going to be able to do it. I just really know if you're prepared to, there's seven documents, so old PDF format, so. We already voted on this, right, Rabbi? At this Hello? point, we already voted on this. Uh, no, there was. I went backwards a little bit because I did not ask for the committee's vote. We had a second, but we didn't go back. So officially, there was no vote on it. So if we want to go this way to leadership, that's fine. Let me go to leadership at this point. Okay. I'm fine with. I'm fine with it going to leadership. Okay. Do we have any objections to that? Do we have everybody's approval? Got to hear those voices. Aye. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. Aye. Okay. That's the way we're going to go. Um, we did old business, new business. 
Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm sorry, <laughs> Rabbi. I'm sorry. Why didn't the district manager email the documents needed for today's vote? Because then this business is held held at fault for no reason because the district manager didn't send the appropriate uh, um, backup or paper needed to have a vote taken that was expected because it was on the agenda. It's not. It's not only just a district manager's uh, thing to do. So. Um, yeah, we we don't know what back there. We don't know what happened. So. Yeah, we don't know what happened, but we already solved for it, so we can move on. Okay. It just feels, seems unfair for this business. Thank you, Lisa. Someone dropped the ball. Debbie, stop Thank you, Lisa. Thank Debbie, you, Lisa. stop it. Thank you, Lisa. They're going to get their vote. So I understand, but Debbie likes to be rude. Thank you. Likes... Thank you, Lisa. She has okay. to stop that. Okay. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Everybody's okay with that? I. Okay. Turn at 8:39. Thank you everybody for joining. Have a safe and healthy evening. Be well. Thanks everyone. Okay. Have a great evening. Take care of yourself. Be well. Bye-bye.